Okay, so we'll get started. So I always get super nervous before the first lecture. I don't know why. Um, well, anyway, I'm Steve Nesgoda, Professor in Material Science and Engineering and Mechanical and Aerospace Engineering. And this is, without a doubt, my absolute favorite course to teach, right? This is the the heart and soul of what I consider material science. Right? This is the, let's take everything we've learned in all the other courses and apply it to actual real things. Um, it was my favorite course as both an undergraduate and a graduate when I was in school. Um, and last year when I had the opportunity to teach it, I jumped on it, and um, the student feedback was really, really good. And a couple people that told me that every question in their interviews, job interviews, um, came directly from my notes and exams, so <laughs> that made me feel pretty good. Um, we're going to do a couple things a little bit differently. I'm going to cut back on some of the extra material that not gonna, it's still gonna be in the notes, but it'll just be a little segregated and say, this is the stuff that you don't need to worry about so much. Uh, but let's, uh, let's go through it. Today's sort of a discussion day and I got some fun stuff at the end. Uh, so really, you're here so you know when and where the course meets. Uh, the course objectives are all on the syllabus. Really, it's alloy design, right? And what happens to uh, processing structure property relations um, in uh, important alloy systems, right? So we know microstructure is the heart of everything to do with materials and specifically metals, right? Yes, you know, composition is like the genetics, right? Then everything you do to that is like the epigenetics, right? It's, you are so much more than just like copies of your parents, right? Because you've had so many experiences in life and you've done different things, and right? Metals are the same way. How we process them, what we do to them has such a profound influence on them. Oftentimes it can be even greater than the chemistry, right? So understanding how this ties in, which means... We need to be able to use mechanics. We need to be able to use thermodynamics. We need to be able to use our understanding of kinetics and put it all together to get a good picture. Right, this is why I find it really exciting. So this is just a list of things that we sort of want to get to. I have to go over the grading thing, so we'll do that real fast before we get into the discussion. So attendance is I, I want you to come. So, right, I'm still going to record all the lectures and they'll be up on the U, on, on my YouTube channel, but, uh, and there will be a couple times where I have to cancel uh, uh, class because of traveling and there, there will, the primary mode of delivery will be through the, the YouTube. That's not going to happen very frequently at all, I promise. But, I still think there's a benefit for you being here, mostly because it's really embarrassing to talk to a class with only five people in it. Mm -hmm. Right? You'll notice, and then uh, first, second, and third exams, I break them up that way so it's not completely overwhelming. Right? So there's sort of a nice, uh, discrete, sort of natural breaking points, which we'll talk about uh, as we as we come up. And you'll notice there is no homework grade. There's only the quiz grade. It's because each week I'll be posting what I like to call questions to ponder, which is really homework, but with a different name. Meaning that I'm not going to grade it or collect it, right? It's, you guys are seniors and graduate students. It's up to you to do those problems, right? Ask me, your classmates. Ben, our TA, right? 
raise your hand there, Harris Ben. Um, about them. And then in class on Fridays, you'll get a question. You have five minutes to answer it. And it's going to be pretty dang similar to one or more of those questions to questions to ponder. Right? So those quizzes are closed book and closed notes. There'll be a couple dropped quiz grades because people screw up, right? If I ask one question out of a list of 10, invariably, at least once or twice during the semester, I'm going to pick the one that you really don't know out of the, you know, when you know the other nine cold. So we'll, we'll drop a couple quizzes. We'll excuse a couple absences. And then there, you will be allowed a, a note sheet for the exams, um, but they will have to follow a fairly specific format and a, sort of a limited subset of information that will be uh, allowed on them. And we'll talk about that more as, as we get close to the exam. All right, all this is on the syllabus. Okay, so here's what I think you all know coming in. And I was very pleased to, to find that I wasn't too far off this last year, right? Now, of course, we're going to revise some of these topics, but let's run down the list, right? And, and, and actually, let's just take an informal poll and feel how confident each of you feels about this, right? Of course, I'm not grading this or taking... Uh, taking um, you know, five minutes after this class, I'll forget who, who raised their hand for what things. Okay, so who feels solid in their thermo? Right. right. So do you think anyone in here feel that they'd be able to derive the Maxwell relations from the fundamental thermodynamic laws? The second derivatives have to be symmetric, right? There's a symmetry with res respect to the the second derivatives, so you can create relationships between all of the, the fundamental parameters, right? What about Gibbs Thompson? Anyone remember what the Gibbs Thompson law says? Anyone can spit it out? It has to do with curvature of a surface, right? And the curvature can have an effect on things like free energy and wetting, right? So what happens if you have a spherical grain embedded in a larger grain? What's gonna happen with time? Right? It's gonna shrink. Right? You may not remember that, but what's gonna happen as it gets smaller? Is it gonna shrink faster or slower? You're going to shrink faster as you get smaller, right? Um, Clausius Duhem. This was one I was surprised that people were not familiar with. This is just a, uh, last year. This is just a, a way of writing the second law of thermodynamics as an inequality for mechanical situations, and it just guarantees that um, when you do thermomechanical work to a system, that you don't have a non-negative dissipation, right? The energy of your system doesn't go up and the entropy of your system doesn't go down when you when you process a process a metal. Okay. Solid liquid and solid solid phase transformations. Here's a hard one. Anyone think they can derive the critical nucleus uh, critical radius for a nucleus right either from uh, solidification or for a solid solid phase transformation? Probably sure if you put pen to paper, a couple of you could, could potentially do it. Um, basic mechanics principles, anisotropic elasticity. Crystals have different mechanical properties along different directions, right? So that the diagonals of an FCC crystal, the body diagonals, have a different stiffness than the than if you're pressing on the along the A, B, or C directions, right? Plasticity, slip planes and slip directions, slip systems, right? 
I'm seeing heads nodding, which is good. Every so often I see, well, there's a lot of no's, but I think, I think, honestly, I think you'll be surprised, right? Fundamentals of dislocation theory. What's the, what's the energy of a dislocation? We'll talk about that later. Right? I heard it. See? <laughs> right? Okay. Basic metallography. Right? You know, when we're looking at micrographs up here, you know, we're looking at a flat section that's been polished and most likely etched if it's an optical. If it's uh, SEM or TEM, the basics of how that was, how that was prepped. We're going to review things as they come up. Um, but we'll look back at this at the, at the end of the semester. And I think you'll be like, oh, yeah, that's actually not that scary of a list. And as we come across these topics, I think you'll, you'll um, remember them. Okay. So here's an absurd question, right? This course is called Physical Metallurgy, Ferrous and Non-Ferrous Alloys, or something along those lines. Right? But what is physical metallurgy? Who, who can answer that? I'm going to pull teeth. Right? And I'm going to pick on Claire because she <laughs> was looking the other way. All right. Okay, so what makes it science? Okay. So, but, I mean, a blacksmith also uses what he knows, right? Like right, I know if I heat this steel up to this color and then quench it, it gets hard. And then if I heat it back up to this color and then let it cool, it's still pretty strong, but it doesn't shatter. What's the difference between that and what us as metallurgists do? What's that? Okay, so we have a, we have a suite of tools, properties. properties. Okay, when let me ask a question. So, when did physical metallurgy begin as a discipline? What was the the key event that made what we do possible? It was a pretty important invention. Yeah. That has to do with uh, steel casting, right? And then the improvements to um, be able to melt iron and cast the steel? Well, I would. I'm thinking of something different, <laughs> but it's not a bad avenue to think down, right? But fundamentally, what, what enabled that? Right. What's what's the key defining concept of all of material science? All right, you guys are getting a degree. Oh, how many of you are MSE? All right, there's a, how many welding? Okay. So the welding people keep an eye on me whenever I if I get into thermodynamic concept that you don't have. Be like, hey, back up, <laughs> right? Because I always forget. Uh, Forget about that. Okay, but in general, you're all in the material science department. What is the key concept behind all of material science? Yeah. Microstructure effects, the property. Microstructure, that's it. Okay, 
going back to physical metallurgy, right? If microstructure is the key concept, what was the critical invention? The microscope, right? The invention of the microscope. Before then, people had no idea that metals were not this homogeneous lump of putty, right? Does anything about the properties of steel make any sense without a description of microstructure that goes along with it? All right? Why does things get hard when you quench them from a high temperature? Why do they get softer when you temper them? And why do they get completely soft when you anneal them? All right? Makes it, it's impossible to form any kind of hypothesis about what's going on without an understanding of microstructure, right? So everything we're going to do ties back to microstructure, right? Is a, so physical metallurgy, I was gonna say, is a fundamental physics and thermodynamics view of how when we heat and beat metals, they change their structure, right? That's like the classical classical view of metallurgy. Eat, eat it and beat it. Right? So that connection. Microstructure processing properties is what makes physical, physical metallurgy uh, as an actual uh, discipline. Okay. Why metals? How many of you feel from the undergrad students, right? How many, uh, how many grad students do we have? It's about half, right? It's interesting because on average last year, the undergrads did just as well. And individually, the high score on every exam is from an undergrad. So don't get too complacent. Okay, so as far as the undergrads, how many feel that they are going to be getting a job that in some way, shape, or form is related to the primary production or processing of metals? Okay, so for those undergrads who didn't raise your hand, where do you think you're going to be working? How many undergrads didn't raise their hand? Didn't seem as unless it was just my eyes playing tricks on me. Okay, everybody. Right? Okay, so why do you think so many people, why do we still make so many things out of metals? And why do we, or, right? Why do you feel comfortable looking for a job in that area? Why aren't you doing functional materials or biomaterials? Why do we still make so many things out of metal, right? Just look around the room. Right? What about, right, what, are the, what are the key attributes that metals have? Yeah. Strength. Strength and, okay, connectivity. So desirable properties, right? Some of those desirable properties. There's one property in particular that is uh, of utmost importance. What do you say? They're crystalline. They're crystalline. That plays into it. That's a structural thing that gives them. But there's a lot of ionic ceramics or crystals too, but you wouldn't want to make an airplane out of them. Right? Yeah. Uh, there is a form. Okay, so malleable and ductile, right? That's getting there. That's not quite. We're not quite there yet. Okay, spit it out. Toughness. That's it. Toughness, right? They dissipate a significant amount of energy by plastic deformation. Do you want an airplane wing that snaps? All right, and shatters? Or do you want one that's going to bend a little bit and have a crack, that a fatigue crack that enters into a slow... 
slow, slow growth regime that you're going to be able to pick it up at the next inspection period. Right? I think the latter. I mean, it's terrifying to think about it, but you get on an airplane and we know that that turbine disc that's holding all those discs in place, all those blades in place, has cracks, right? It has flaws, it has defects, right? Metals are exceptionally damage tolerant. Right? And we're trying to engineer more and more damage tolerance damage tolerance into them, right? So what are the trade-offs we make, right? Well, they're not as strong as they could be because we don't want them to fracture, right? And there's this quote I like, and I wish I knew who said this. It's like one of these things that I heard, but I could never attribute to anyone, actually. And it says, ceramics are the materials of tomorrow and will always be, right? meaning I've been promised the, 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 the promising material of the future for the last 100 years now. Right. Okay, who has a car that's more than 10 years old? Who has a car that's less than a year old? Nobody. Right. Okay, so if when your car was, those of you with an old car, when your car was built, Think back, All right, you guys were much younger then, but what did people envision cars would be like? Like, we'll go back even a little further, from the early 2000s, right? What were cars primarily made out of? Steel. Steel. What are cars primarily made out of now? Steel, Steel right? If you asked in 2000 what people thought cars would be like, almost every design engineer um, and even people in this department probably would have said composites, All right? There have been really significant differences between a car from 15, 20 years ago to the cars now. Right. How many types of steel were in a car in 2000? Maybe three. How many different types of steel are in a car now? Right. We're basically tailoring the structure and the composition and the type of steel to the specific properties and performance that we want that particular part to have. Right? We want a our B pillar to buckle in a certain way, right? And we want it not to fracture, we want it not to bend, right? We want it to divert energy in certain ways so the passenger compartment is safe. So there's certain advanced high strain steels we can use there. Right? We don't want to use those steels in a crumple zone, right? Right. So that's why, you know, I think, honestly, these are some of the, two of the most important slides, right, in the whole, in the whole course, right? Physical metallurgy is structure prop, prop, properties processing, exploring that with physics and thermodynamics, right? And we use metals because we can control those properties and they dissipate a huge amount of energy through plastic deformation. So they, they have a, a high degree of, of strength and toughness. Right? So this slide is subtitled, How I Think About Metallurgical Problems. Right? This is, I'm throwing this out. This is sort of a cheat sheet for the whole semester. Right? This is the toolbox I have in my head when I think about a problem, right? So for those grad students, right, I have to sit through, I have to read a whole lot of theses, right? I have to sit through dissertation overviews and candidacy exams. And 
I hear a bunch of talks on a different bunch of different things, and I have to somehow be able to make sense of all that, right? And in a candidacy exam, I have to be able to make ask rational questions about what people just talked about, right? So how do I think about these things, right? If someone shows me two micrographs and, and says they did this heat treatment, does it make rational sense that these two are related by that, right? Or is it surprising that that's a result, right? So this is sort of what I, what I think about, right? So a couple key ideas, right? So phase stability. The Hume Rothery rules. I'm going to talk about those on a different slide. Who's heard of the Hume Rothery rules? Oh, good. More people than more people than last year, right? What is it? What do they tell you? Right. Yeah. Whether two uh, metals will form a solid solution, or whether they're going to phase separate or create an intermetallic, right? Okay. Anything to do with long range diffusion? Right? Square root dt. Right? That's the answer for everything diffusion. Square root dt. Right? Right? And that the diffusivity is Arrhenius with the activation energy. Right? So the temperature dependence, because of this exponential, the diffusivity can change by many orders of magnitude over a fairly small temperature range depending on the magnitude of the activation energy, right? So it's not surprising to have diffusivities that go from 10 to the minus 12 to 10 to the minus 17 over a temperature range, self-diffusivity in zirconium over a couple hundred degrees, right? Okay, so the jump frequency, right? So if I have atoms on a, a regular lattice, how often will they change, change position, right? Line energy of a dislocation, right? Anything with dislocations and energy, GB squared. Anything with dislocations in the stress field, GB divided by the distance, right? right. We'll talk about how to, how to uh, derive some of these, but, you know, these are basic things, right? How do we relate the yield strength to our dislocation density? Right? That's square root of our dislocation density. It's going to be proportional. Anyone have a physical picture of why that would be? You think about dislocations as lying in a plane. We think about the separation between those dislocations. We can do some basic statistics and and come up with with this as to relatively how far dislocations can travel before they're impinged upon by another by another defect. Solid solution strengthening we'll talk about, but it's the effect is going to be with the square root of the concentration. And this is the strain field induced by the size mismatch. Right? So it's going to depend on the mismatch of the size of the atoms and how many of those atoms you have there. Right? It makes there's a, a certain physical sense to it, right? What goes into it? Precipitate, for if we have precipitation strengthening, like a lot of aluminum alloys we're going to talk about, right? Whether or not we cut through the precipitates or bow around them by Orowan bowing is going to have to do with the, the radius of the particle, the distance between them, right? For cutting the surface energy term, right? Of course, we all know Hall patch, right? So interestingly enough, David Dunstan, oh, where is he? He took, he took a look at all the Hall patch data available in the literature and did a really good statistical analysis and found that there's no actual um, high, when you do a high subject to a hypothesis test, there's no real evidence for it being the square root of the diameter, right? It's some fractional exponent, but it's not, there's no real evidence that it's actually a square root. 
right? The rest of them, right? Grain growth, the velocity of a moving interface has to do with the mobility, the surface energy, and the curvature, right? This is why that example I said when you have a grain in uh, a spherical grain embedded in a larger grain, as it shrinks, the velocity speeds up, right? Because as it gets smaller, the curvature gets curvature gets tighter and tighter, right? Zener, Zener pinning, right? I have obstacles and I have interfaces that are growing through a field of obstacles. How much of a drag force does the does the field of obstacles uh, impart? Right. So nucleation and growth, right? Homogeneous nucleation and growth, right? JMAC or Evrami, right? So this is just the expression for the volume fraction transformed. What are the assumptions that go into Evrami? I know you've seen this at least twice. For the seniors, you did it both in thermo and in... Uh, Trans not well, was it in transport? It was probably in um, the Porter, the, the Porter and Easterling course. What's it called? Now? Transformations and, and yeah, right. So, what are the assumptions right. that you're nucleating homogeneously and anisotropically? Right, you have spherical nuclei that grow. Right? Basic assumptions. So what goes into this? What's this n dot? Right? That's the nucleation rate. What thermodynamic parameters go into the nucleation rate? Degree of undercooling, right? What fluctuates with the degree of undercooling? If I have a large, is it, what's the answer to everything thermal? Gibbs free. Gibbs free energy, right? Okay. So if I have a temperature, a nucleation temperature, and I'm slightly below it, so I'm nucleating, say, phase A into phase B, right? As I go down the undercooling, what happens to the Gibbs free energy? Increases, right? What else do I need? I need to be able to grow these, right? So what happens to my mobility as my undercooling? It decreases, right? So I have something that's increasing and something that's decreasing. So what is that going to give me? There's some temperature, some optimal undercooling where that's at a maximum, right? And I'll have the greatest nucleation, right? The last two concepts, right? Regular solution theory, right? This is super useful. What's, what is regular solution theory? What is a regular solution? How does it deviate from an ideal solution? Right. An ideal solution, the Entropy and the enthalpy are just linear combinations of the two components, right? But in a regular solution, the entropy is right, just the entropy of mixing, and then the enthalpy is allowed to deviate, right? So you can have positive or negative enthalpies of enthalpies of mixing, right? And then probably the most important thing that you learned in thermodynamics, right? The common tangent construction for chemical potential, right? Because this is going to be, we're going to use this a lot of times to determine what phases are going to come out as a function of temperature, right? And explain why non-equilibrium phases appear, why we get a series of metastable phases that form before the equilibrium phase. Right? Because if you look at it, you might have way too big of a change of, right? 
before you can get there. Okay, so how much time do we have? Oh, plenty. So the last thing, we'll, we'll end a little bit early today. So the last thing I wanted to, to go over was, was humorothery, right? And so I guess this is where the, the class starts in earnest, right? So this is the first real, real important topic. So those, those um, the last two slides, use those as if you're going over the questions to ponder and things, or if I'm giving you something and you just don't know how to make sense of it, look at those two sheets because I can pretty much guarantee you that the answer I'm looking for is related, is, is on there, right? What I'm asking you to, to analyze is related to one of those, one of those things. So, Humorothery, Sir William Humorothery, right? So he founded the Department of Metallurgy, which became the Department of Materials at Oxford, in the 1950s, he's one of my uh, uh, funny story about. Him. He was a um, one of my advisors, one of my co-advisors, co-advisor. So sort of like my academic step grandfather, <laughs> <laughs> I guess you could say, right? But he did a whole bunch of really seminal work on alloys. Um, a huge amount of work in the uh, development of of a lot of um, commercially important aluminum and magnesium alloys, but he became deaf as an adult due to a viral infection, right? And um, of course, uh, being deaf as an adult, right? He had no difficulty communicating by speech, speaking to people but he would have difficulty with volume control. And so he would go to conferences and have graduate students transcribe the uh, presentations for him so he could follow what was going on. And one day, my uh, Roger Doherty, a name you'll hear probably a couple times throughout the course, um, was had this task, and some speaker came up and... Uh, Sir Hume Rothery said, oh, don't bother writing this one down. It's not going to be worth reading. <laughs> right? Of course, he meant to whisper it and said it in a very loud voice that the whole, the whole hall under, uh, overheard. And so you can imagine, like, you know, you have the preeminent metallurgist in your field announcing that right before you get up to give a talk. <laughs> right? I think uh, that's, that's worse than the... the my first talk as a graduate student at TMS on when it was when they didn't have a full day Thursday, it was just a half day, half day Thursday. And I had like the last talk before the final end of the conference. And of course, everyone left early Thursday morning. So it was me and the session chair in the room. <laughs> so, okay. So, so Sir, Sir William Hume Rothery, he, he looked at a whole bunch of different alloys and compositions, and he came up with these basic rules of thumb to determine if a alloy, if, if two elements are going to mix to make a, a solid solution across their entire composition. How, how rare is that? Do most metals mix well in the solid state? Not, not really, right? There's not a lot of binaries that are perfect compositions, right? right. If you think about what a phase diagram looks like, right? There's no eutectics, there's no, right? It's this nice, beautiful, right? I mean, right? That's the first binary phase diagram you ever saw, right? How many of them actually look, how many of them actually look like that? So he basically said a couple different observations. He said that the radius, the size shouldn't be too different between the two, between the two elements, right? 
once you get beyond 15% or so, it just doesn't work. It doesn't work as well. Right? Yeah. The crystal structures should be the same or at least similar. Right? Makes sense, right? Doesn't work to mix an HCP with an FCC, even though they're both close packed, right? Things get things get wonky, right? This is the one that always throws people off, right? And this is the one in candidacy exams when I ask people who is the one. If they're going to drop one of, the f one of the five, this is the one they drop. Four, right? Complete solubility occurs when the <coughs> solvent and solute have the same valency, right? I mean, there's this concept of electronic stabilization of crystal structure. We'll talk about that. Uh, on the next slide and show an example, right? And then the solute and solvent should have similar electronegativity. Why is the electronegativity really important? Think back to Chem 1. What is electronegativity? Yeah. Like how much atoms right yeah how right how how deficient they are right so if you have ones that have very different electronegativities they form what ionic bonds right means that there's an electron transfer from one to the other right so that means we have intermetallics right so anytime you have two uh, two metals that have a vastly different electronegativities, you know you're going to uh, uh, form likely brittle intermetallics that are going to cause you problems. Okay. So the electronic stabilization, this is kind of a, a tricky thing, and I, I you see I've got two different font sizes here. So the, the important concepts are up here. These are sort of special cases, right? So the electronegativities is the most important. This came from a really excellent review article from the 1970s, uh, of electronic structure of the Hume-Rothery phases. Uh, Hume-Rothery phases means that these phases that come about because of electronic structure uh, um, in the metal. So if you really want to read 110 pages on it, you have the reference. It actually is a really good um, review article, right? So this one here is the tendency for a definite crystal structure to occur at characteristic electron atom ratios got cut off. This is called the electron concentration. Right? So, just like if you think back to ceramics, your ceramics class, right? When you have atoms of different ratios and you're trying to pack them together, the number of nearest neighbors depends on the ratio difference. And so that means you're going to have certain crystal structures that appear as a function of that ratio difference, right? So, close packed. Right, if I have at, if I have ones that are the same size, I can exactly fit six. Right, if I'm my if I'm my central atom becomes smaller, right, I have a gap. Right, so that means I'm really only going to be able to fit five around it until I get to the critical, because nature doesn't want they want to be touching. Right, they don't want that that gap. It's the same concept here, except for electrons. There's certain crystal structures that come about based on this electron ratios between solute and solvent, right? And then these are, have to do with the uh, completion of octets of certain groups. And the idea that you want to fill uh, the D shell in certain transition elements before uh, other types of, of filling. And then, uh, orbital type interactions, right? These are the 
the kinds of things that DFT modelers tend to worry about, but us mere mortals ignore. Um, right? And so if we look at copper zinc, right, if we look at this phase diagram, there's all these phases here, right? And all of these come about strictly as a function of this electron concentration ratio, right? By all the other criteria of the hume rothery rules, they should form a nice solid solution, but they don't because of the, the electronic structure. And this is very pronounced in the noble metals, right? What are the noble metals? So the noble gases are like unreactive gases because they have Right. So what are the noble metals? Okay. So typically, what are our most unreactive metals? Gold. Right. Our coinage metals, gold, silver, platinum, copper. Right. Those are nicknamed the noble metals. Right. Okay. And then there's a second set of hume rothery rules for interstitial solid solutions. Right? The most obvious being that the solute atoms should be smaller than the interstitial sites in your uh, the solvent. Yeah, solute atoms should be smaller than the interstitial sites in your in your solvent. Right? Copper in uh, iron. I mean, yeah, carbon in iron, not copper. Right? Oxygen and nitrogen and titanium, right? really important interstitials, right? Nitrogen and niobium, right? So again, similar electronegativities, it should show a wide range of compositions, right? And the same valence, again, because we don't want to form, uh, we don't want to form an ionic bond between, between the two. Okay, so that's it for today. Make sure I have the um, sign-in sheet. There won't be a quiz, obviously, on Friday, but I'm going to give everyone a really small take-home quiz, we'll call it, um, instead. And that is because I am really, 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 really bad with faces and names, especially out of context, right? Like, so... I can know everyone's, learn everyone's name in a class. And then if I like go see you at the bar an hour later, it like doesn't connect, right? Cause it's, <laughs> right. So what I'm gonna post on Carmen is for Monday, I'd like everyone to put a little thing together with their, a picture of them. Like doesn't have to be a formal thing. It can be like an, Right, something that a picture that's going to help me remember who you are with a couple sentences about something interesting that I can connect it to, other than then this person sits at this spot in this classroom. Right, so that will be the first the first thing I'll post it on Carmen. The lectures will typically be posted the day after, so by sometime tomorrow or at the very latest Friday morning, this lecture will be posted. For anyone who really wants to watch it again, I'm not sure why you would. Um, but, uh, yeah, have a good, uh, a good Thursday, and we'll see you. Oh, and I'm really sorry about the 4 to 5 o'clock. That wasn't, that wasn't my choice. Last year it was 8 a.m., and I requested a change so I could go take my kids to school. And this was, they gave me the second worst time. Uh, so, sorry.